close the door. Uh, my apologies in advance. Uh, my German is basically being able to count one through five. I have so many languages in my head as it is, I can't yet get another one in. So if I'm going too quickly, uh, today is, this is an English presentation. If I go too quickly, please let me know. Right? I tend to, at some points, speed up. <laughs> uh, yeah, so if there, and, or if there are questions as we go through, if something is not clear, uh, if something needs extra explanation, uh, or if we need to come up with a communal question, if someone needs help translating a question into English, we'll, we can do that together as a group. So, as a small enough group, we should be able to try to uh, get to what we need. Um, so today we're going to be talking about bloodletting in Chinese medicine. The first half of the day, uh, for those of you, I'm not, some of you I assume will be here the whole day, both parts, some of you will be here for one part, maybe not the other. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how many people are coming in and out. But the idea is to try to make the first part of the day a little bit more focused on theory and a little bit of history. Uh, I think for those of us practicing Chinese medicine or any of the derivations of Chinese medicine, the history to some extent is, I, I think it helps us to understand where we came from and what sort of the antecedents are. I think it helps to inform to some extent at least a little bit of modern day practice. But if we focus too much on the history, then there's not enough time for anything else. We could talk about the history all day long. So we'll talk just a little bit about history this morning. We'll talk a little bit about the classic texts and the references in the classic texts to bloodletting. Uh, we'll look at some of the basic theory behind blood, the different channels we associate with bloodletting. Uh, and then at some point eventually, probably this afternoon is my guess, we'll talk more about very specific, some treatment protocols uh, we'll look at Master Dong's lineage. It's a family lineage of acupuncture that uh, that I teach about quite a bit, and so we'll we'll look about we'll look at just a brief introduction to that lineage. We'll be talking more about that tomorrow if you're interested in learning more in general about Dong's acupuncture. But because Master Dong's acupuncture makes very heavy use of bloodletting therapy, and he also does distal point bloodletting, so it's to some extent very different from. Uh, from what most people think of as bloodletting. Most of the time when I come across students or practitioners who are already using bloodletting, it tends to be either Jingwell points, which is something we talk about very commonly in the modern Chinese literature, or we look at like local bleeding and cupping, something like that. Uh, where in Dong's acupuncture, there's something that's very unique and I think provocative, it makes us really think about it, what we're really doing and why we're doing it, is we do distal point bloodletting like we do distal point needling. Right? So, uh, so we, for example, can treat chronic knee pain by bloodletting the upper back, right? So we'll look at some of these points and these, these, the basic layout of points in Master Dong's acupuncture. I'll apologize in advance. These slides, I decided that when I first put the presentation together, I didn't think we'd have time to cover it, but I think it's interesting enough we really are going to cover it. So those slides are not in the handout that went out on the, on the electronic copy. So if anyone wants the, the more recent handout later on, take my card and email me, and I'll just email you the, the, the uh, PDF. Uh, and then we'll look at, at the end, uh, later at the end of today, a uh, combination of bloodletting with acupuncture treatment for treating compound patterns, right? So for treating complex combinations of patterns with stasis and heat uh, and other types of things bloodletting is associated with as well, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> It'll be easier once there's a presentation. This will slow me down, and then I'll try to do the best I can. Uh, okay. How many of you actually use bloodletting already in your practice, at least a little bit? Some of you. Great. Excellent. Good, good, good. So we, won't have to, we don't have to try to convert you, <laughs> bring you to the dark side then. Right. You're, ready. you're already there. You're, pre, you're preconditioned. Uh, d does anyone here speak or read Chinese? Any Chinese? OK. So on occasion, what you'll see is we'll take Chinese characters and break them down. Uh, I have to, in full, in full disclosure, my Chinese is, my spoken Chinese is very, very minimal. It's pretty awful. Uh, but I, I speak and read Japanese, and because of that, I can read Chinese characters. So my pronunciation is not so good, although my character writing is okay. So to help us understand some of the ideas, at some point, we'll take some of the Chinese characters and break them down. Because it's interesting to be able to see what the sort of meanings in the terms are. Chinese medical terminology in China is a very precise scientific language, right? It has specific definitions and specific meanings that although they've changed throughout